uh, unfair cost for you, but I decided that you're gonna have so many talks at once, so I'm gonna try something different. I'm gonna tell you a story. And the story is the education of my children, okay? I talk with a lot of students, a lot of young people, young entrepreneurs, and they all come to me, you know, with bright eyes, and fresh idea, and they always ask me, this, the very first question they always ask me, how did we get here? Okay, so let me tell you how it happened. I'm a product of Silicon Valley. I went to Berkeley, got my PhD, came out, and went straight into Silicon Valley, worked for a company, company got sold to Cisco, I did really well. At some point it's like, you know, I don't really need to do work for a living, let's go try something else. And I remember how much I like teaching, so I applied and I got uh, offer a consultant professorship part-time at Stanford. So I started teaching. So they put me in to teach. The first class that I taught was a class that you have to take to graduate a either a computer science major or electrical engineering major. Okay? Basically, I stand between them and their diploma. <laughs> they didn't care what I was saying. They didn't care what they have to do. As long as, at the end, they get the diploma. So the second class I taught at Stanford was a class that you need to take to declare yourself as an electrical engineer, okay? So I taught a class, had a great time, but basically the class, and then I was explaining war story. That class was all about, every week I had to come in and I had to teach them a new thing. Signal to norm ratio, uh, how to draw a two table, whatever it is. If somebody asks me a question and I spend half an hour explaining to them something, any concept, basically I'm playing catch up for the rest of the quarter. So after that I was getting really tired. Also I get also like, if you give me any less than an A, my government will revoke my, re my scholarship, I will be shipped home, I will be shipped to my family, my village, my province, and my country. So I got tired of having to decide on people's grades. So I decided I want to teach something different. So I came up with this idea called a Stanford had these small, very selective, small seminars for freshmen and sophomores. I say, oh, I talk to my friend, Andrew Goldsmith, and I say, hey, let's teach a class. That's called the Art and Science of Engineering Design. We take a bunch of freshmen, they don't know anything. We put, have them pick their team, pick whatever project they want to work on, and let's run with it. So the second time I taught that class, somebody came in and said, a young woman named Nicole, Nicole Fittler, that's her name. She came and she said, I want to design a medical clinic for flood prone regions like Bangladesh. She got three other students to sign up to do the project. Andrea and I look at each other and say, fantastic, great idea. You should do this because we don't know anything about how to build a medical clinic and we have never been to Bangladesh. We have no idea what a flood prone region would need. But what we're going to do is we're going to go and find your advisors who will help you. I have a pretty large Rolex in Silicon Valley. I went to my Rolex and I couldn't find anybody who knows anything about global health, anything about building medical clinics. So in desperation, I sent an email to my neighborhood. And I said, because I live in a neighborhood full of very smart, accomplished people. So I say, hey, here's the project I have. Can anybody help me? And I got a message back from this first speaker, Erica Wojcic, who actually lives two, two houses down from me. She said, you know, I am a physician. I also work a lot in global health. I can help you. So, then my four students, freshmen, no experience with global health, no experience with engineering, no experience with design. They have eight weeks. In those eight weeks, they came up with the design. They actually do a sketch up. They also do a fake model. They show you how quickly this clinic can be set up in case of a flood. They walk through the whole process of when somebody comes into the clinic, how they get treated, how they get triaged, treated, and get medication at the end. They even work on, you know, flood only happens once in a while. What will we do with this space when it's over? Okay? At the end of each year, the committee in charge of the freshman and sophomore seminar asked us to nominate some of the best work that we had in the class. There are now 200 of these classes at Stanford. So there are 200 
nomination. So we nominated that. It was such a special year. We nominated two groups. The medical clinic was one of them. They didn't win. Actually, it was a runner-up. So what happened is this. I think you talked about this. I talked to a lot of students. I spent a lot of time with them outside of the classroom. Um, they called to me and they said the following. You know, I would love to do engineering if it was more socially relevant. I want to help my country. I want to help my village. I want to help my tribe. I want to help the world. So because Erica helped one of my students' group, I said, you know, since I'm sending my student over to her, I need to find out what this GHI is doing. So I went in and I started studying and went and talked to Erica. And if anybody who knows Erica will know that once she sells you the Kool-Aid, you will drink it. <laughs> so I ended up become part of JHIF. And I say, you know, the student can come in and tell me they want a class that teach them about socially relevant things. I'm going to call them on it. So 2010, I started a class called Engineering for Good, Eden 46. And the premise of the class is this. You come in, there's a list of projects that we got from our NGOs and not-for-profit companies. You pick a project, you get together, you get support from advisors in the field, and you work on the project. Okay? You finish a project, and you hand it over to the next group. So, the first time I joined the class, we were in 2010, we had 13 students working on five projects. Okay? And the comment, so because it was the first time I taught a class, at the end of the uh, year, I went to see the chair of the department because I wanted to tell him you know, how it went. I went online and read the comment from the students. I don't cry easily. My children have seen me cry probably four times in their life. I read these comments and I cried. The students basically loved it. They thought it's the most amazing experience that they have ever had at Stanford. Many of them called it the best class that they have taken at Stanford. So I was buoyed by that experience. So the, two years later, in 2010, I taught the class again. This time we've got 18 students. And again, same model. What I tell the students is this. Yes, you can take classes that require you to work on projects. Yes, you can volunteer to work for NGOs. Here's the difference, this class. In Union for Good, we require that you work on real world, open, complex problems. We require that you produce real results on real projects. This is not making link. I'm not spending all this effort, all my time. I'm not gonna waste my driver's time and my partner's time so you guys can come here and have a nice learning experience. You should have a nice learning experience, but we want something in return. And I was very skeptical about this because we have a quarter. So basically the student have about seven weeks to produce something. What can they do? Well, usually, as many of you know, as all of you know, with the pressure, but with guidance and structure, they come up with amazing stuff. What's also really amazing is at the end of the quarter, many of them will come and say, can I work, can I work some more of this? Can I do more? And the answer is, let me think about it. <laughs> so from Engineering for Good class, I started a program called Stanford Gap for Good. And the idea is this, you work in the, um, the spring quarter on a project. And in the summer, we're gonna send you out to the field so that you can get to see how it works in the field and refine your design. And then more, most importantly, to pass the project on to the next generation. So we'll work with a number of, uh, for example, uh, we work with an organization called Resource and they build uh, toilets <coughs> to slum and heat. We've been with them for a long time. They actually started by a bunch of students from Stanford in, uh, in the design school. We like them so much that we now have about three or four generations of students working with them. And they are now going to Haiti to Peru, so we're now working with the Peru group. Okay, so <coughs> what I find really amazing is the fact that I came up with the name Engineering for Good because the class in the electrical engineering department in school of engineering because I'm an engineer and I don't know any better. But what I asked of the student, I basically for about three years 
Anybody who called me up or emailed me and said, I want to talk to you about engineering for good, to stay for death for good, off I go. I need people, I talk to everybody. I must talk to about four or five hundred people right now about the project at the school. I talk to many of the faculty members in different departments. And my goal for the class is the following. I want everybody from freshmen all the way to seniors because I want undergraduates. We have many fine programs for graduate students. For example, the student, uh, the graduate student program in the school of design, that's great. I want to focus on undergraduate. I want you to walk into the class and it does not matter what major. I have people from obviously electrical engineering, computer science, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, but I also have psychology majors. I have a lot of comp bio, human biology. I have a lot of philosophy students, urban studies. I spend a lot of time going to talk to faculty and staff from different departments to get that diversity. I also want a class that reflects the world. I want my students to be male and female, so ratio is about half and half. I have student, poorest student, as opposed to American student. I have students who are brown, who speak Spanish. I have people from Africa as well as African American students. Okay. So that's what we're doing. Um, it's not a new model, but I think that we are working on a, a more, I think, engaged model and a more realistic model. So, did you tell us how hard it is to get into the class? Oh, oh, so the class starts from 13 students in the first year, 18 students in the second year. The third year, we have 25, 50, 50 students applying for 25 spots. And last winter, we have 75 applications for 25. Okay, so scaling is a problem that I work on, uh, and that's what I'm hoping to do. Uh, but I don't make a distinction between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. I saw problems. Because poor people are 4 billion of out, 4 billion of out of 7 billion, we have lots of problems. Just solve them. <laughs> Whining already. You know, quit the hand wringing. We have problems, we solve them. Any questions? That anybody want to ask? We'll give questions. Yeah. Because we're one more speaker. No, leaving to Juneau, Alaska. I have several problems with the folks who we work with. Oh, we work with a group in, in Alaska. Good. It's actually the next one. I'd love to talk to you. Oh, by the way, please get in touch with me if you have projects. You have, if you want to volunteer as an advisor. So I'm very, um, when I go to party, people always ask me, like, what do you do? And I tell them, and they say, oh, you know, I know about toilet building, or I'm from Bhutan. And I say, can I have your phone number? Can I have your email? And I put them away, and they forget all about me. And then a year, two, three, four years later, I call them and I say, oh, I email and I say, we met, remember me? I have a project. I would love you to be my advisor, for, for my student advisor. And the amazing thing is I have a roster of about 100 to 150 advisors, and they come back year after year after year. They work with group of students, after group of students, because they love them. I'll suggest two projects, which may be appealing to everyone here. One, how are we going to accommodate millions of environmental refugees who are driven from low-lying coastal areas? Yes. Are we going to build new cities for them? Mm -hmm. And if so, where? You have a dream job, in my opinion. I do. Pay money to do what you do. Yeah. But I'm overlapping it. I'm actually the chair of the next one of these conferences, and what I'm interested in doing offline, perhaps, is wiring into the people who collect the problems that we then want to yes. pose to the world. Yes. You know, in the next conference, I want to continue to attract practitioners. Yes. Attract the people who want to come and learn what the practitioners are doing and the people who want to sponsor that work. Yep. And which begs the question, where do the problems come from? Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to be wired in.
So we'll do one of them. Yeah. Okay. So just um, we'll do the question. We just have four minutes to finish. And we'll come back and look at it. But I think the problems are between my gap for good and the work we do. We probably have 150 problems that are yeah. gathered mm -hmm. that are ready to be put up. But I think something a way to be able to put these problems up and bring the mentors in or bring the advisors in could be very helpful to you. In the big conference. IEEE process going yeah. forward, I want to have not only conferences where we get together and discuss stuff and places where we publish it, but places where we collect and say, here are problems, anyone want to bid for this? Anyone want to take this and run with it? So, so, it's, so maybe we can have that discussion also Right. Let me save that. So maybe we'll do a, like a donor suit, but except it's these projects with people who want to take them up. I'm going to deal with yeah. Florida at this point.